next on Unsolved Mysteries. An SUV is found abandoned on a remote Wyoming highway. What happened to Don Kim? My son was murdered. I believe this. This upscale restaurant south of San Francisco was once a haunt for bootleggers. Now it's haunted by the ghost of a bootlegger's wife. A 23-year-old college student takes off on a cross-country journey following in the footsteps of the legendary writer Jack Kerouac. And then she disappears. And nearly an hour after doctors pronounced him dead, a newborn baby miraculously comes back to life. Some hot cases some cold cases, and some cases with surprising revelations. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. In the middle of the desolate Wyoming prairie, an SUV is found abandoned. Its doors are open, the engine is running, and clothes are scattered all over the highway. The owner of the car, 35-year-old Don Kemp, is nowhere in sight. Four years after he disappeared, Don's body is found just a few miles from where his blazer was abandoned. The sheriff believes that Don froze to death in a blizzard three days after he was lost. However, Don's family is not convinced. My son was murdered. I definitely believe this. Absolutely. He was murdered. Mary Kemp began her own investigation. She has turned up alarming evidence that her son's death was not an accident. Most disturbing is a series of telephone calls that Don made five months after he supposedly died. Don Kemp was a promising young advertising executive in New York City until he was severely disabled in a traffic accident. After he recovered, he chose not to return to Madison Avenue. He had become disillusioned with materialism, and um, I think he wanted a simpler, a simpler time and a quieter time. And I think that's what drew him to that area. Don sold almost everything he owned and began a long drive west. His destination was Jackson Hole, Wyoming, where he planned to write a book about Abraham Lincoln's assassination. The day before he disappeared, Don was seen at a museum in Cheyenne. He wandered through the small galleries for two hours, speaking to no one. When he left, Don apparently forgot his attaché case. In it were his traveler's checks, diaries, and his driving glasses. The next day at 10 a.m., highway patrolman Randy Teeters came upon an eerie sight, Don's abandoned car in the middle of nowhere. The vehicle was left 40 miles from any town on an off-ramp, running, stuff strung out of it, the doors open. Neither of us has seen anything like this. When he found the car, Randy noticed a single set of footprints leading from the roadside into that lonely, empty prairie. The local sheriff's department concluded that Don wandered off alone. But Don's mother believes he was abducted. I was certain he was in a horrible jam. I, I just felt it, because this was so unlike my son. Uh, I knew that he hadn't walked out there. I feel that he didn't. Um, and yet the sheriff kept saying that he was out there. Well, I think he was mentally disturbed. He was having mental problems and possibly some health problems. 
Deputy Rod Johnson flew over the area for two hours. He could see for miles over the open terrain, but there was no trace of Don. I felt the guy was disorientated, and I felt that he didn't want to be found. If he would have wanted to be found, he would have heard the aircraft, could have came up, waved his arms, got attention, gone up to a ridge anywhere and, and be, been sighted. Later that day, Johnson and two other deputies found a duffel bag lying near the single set of footprints. In it were laundry soap, clothes, a teapot, all belonging to Don. I believe they were put there to look like my son had walked out there. And I don't believe my son did. Tracks in the snow led searchers to a barn six miles from the highway. Inside was a pile of sticks arranged to start a fire and three of Don's socks. Three socks that were found in the barn were Donnie's socks. I have no idea how they got there. I think they were put there by someone other than my son. Three days after he disappeared, a blizzard made it impossible to continue the search. Three years later, a group of hunters discovered Don's remains just a few miles from where his SUV was abandoned. Oh, yeah, that's, uh, that's human. An autopsy showed no signs of foul play. We never did suspect foul play. He was out there and was avoiding us stayed away from us, and I believe on the second or third day, he was going to try to get back to his vehicle. He seen he was in trouble, and he didn't make it. This is where the case of Don Kemp should have ended. But Mary Kemp has been haunted by two clues that just don't fit. A sighting of Don and a number of mysterious phone calls. Five months after Don supposedly died in the blizzard, he was seen 150 miles away in Casper, Wyoming. Not once, but twice. He was reported to be at a traveling exhibit of Abraham Lincoln memorabilia and at a local tavern. Mary Kemp talked to a bartender who distinctly remembers serving Don. Around that time, one of Don's closest friends returned home from vacation. On her answering machine, she found six different telephone messages from Don. I'm absolutely certain that it was his voice. And it was a very brief message. Uh, I'd like to speak to you again. Call me in a phone number. The next day, I called, asked to speak to Don. A man answered the phone. He said that Don was out. I'm convinced he holds the clue to what really happened to Don. Telephone records prove that the calls were made from a trailer in Casper, Wyoming. The young man who was renting the trailer at the time said the phone company must have made a mistake. He told us that he had no knowledge of the phone calls and that he had not made the phone calls. I had an occasion to show him a picture of Donald Kemp, and he said that he did not know Donald Kemp, had never seen Donald Kemp, and knew nothing of, of his whereabouts. Mary wasn't satisfied with the man's story, so she went to Wyoming to conduct her own investigation. God knows what happened to my son in that trail. It's, it's too horrible to contemplate. I don't know. I tried in every way I knew how to contact this young man. I finally spoke with him only one time on the phone, and I asked him about my son. And he said he knew nothing about Don Kemp. He knew nothing about Don Kemp. He just paid those phone bills. He didn't look at them. And I told this young man he was lying. You know what has happened to my son. And he just hung up on me. Three weeks after he was questioned, the young man moved out of the trailer and left Casper. I have no reason to feel that the individual here in Casper had any knowledge of this man's uh, even being in Wyoming other than these phone calls. And I, I, I don't have an explanation for it, neither, nor did he. Who made the phone calls? That's the big question. Who it was it had to have been my son. So what really did happen to Don Kemp in that vast Wyoming prairie? 
Sheriff Ogburn thinks he died in the blizzard, but he can't explain the phone calls. Mary believes that Don was abducted, taken to Casper, and murdered. But then why was his body found just three miles from the abandoned blizzard? Somebody can tell me exactly what happened to my son, because I know there are people who know what happened to my son. I know this. If you have any information about the disappearance of Don Kemp, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, the ghostly legend of a beautiful lady in blue. Moss Beach is a lonely, windswept cove 20 miles south of San Francisco. A restaurant called the Moss Beach Distillery overlooks the water. And during Prohibition, it was a notorious speakeasy. In recent years, strange things have been reported here. Waitresses say cold winds blow through the dining room when no windows or doors are open. A former owner claims she's seen objects fly through the air and doors locked mysteriously. For decades, employees of the Moss Beach Distillery have reported seeing ghosts. According to local legend, one spirit dates back to the Roaring Twenties, the beautiful Lady in Blue. The speakeasy at Moss Beach was a hangout for bootleggers. It was also the setting for a legendary love triangle. The lady was beautiful. She always wore blue. The piano player had eyes only for her, but their romance was conducted in secret because the lady in blue belonged to someone else. Her husband was a bootlegger, and one night she made a serious mistake. Unaware that he would soon arrive, she signaled the piano player to meet her on the beach. The bootlegger saw his wife with the piano player and went crazy with jealousy. The lady threw herself between the two men. When the struggle was over, the beautiful lady in blue was dead, a victim of her lover's dagger. Some swear that her ghost haunts Moss Beach to this very day. Believers claim that she breathes a cold wind down the necks of women she views as rivals. Other employees say she calls out their names when they're alone. Brian. In the dining room. She's mischievous. A lot of pranks will happen, a lot of things will go on, but I don't think that any of it is uh, malicious. I don't think that anything is, is supposed to be hair raisings and you running out of a building or anything else like that. She's good, she's, uh, she seems to be a kind soul, nice spirit. When Pat and Dave Andrews own the Moss Beach Distillery, they say the lady in blue seemed to enjoy locking them out of their rooms. The lady in blue also played other tricks when Pat was all alone in the office. My checkbook lifted right off the shelf above my head and sailed around this small room. Just put it back. And I just told her to put it back and it went right back onto the shelf. I just didn't believe in it. And then uh, as, uh, as time went on, uh, the things that happened, you know, totally brought me around to the point of view that there, it, it is here. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It happened. The mysterious lady in blue may not be the only ghost haunting the Moss Beach distillery. A psychic named Sylvia Brown says that when she visited the tavern, she sensed the presence of another spirit. I walked in and said, oh my God, there is a ghost here. And I'm getting the name 
Mary Ellen Morley. He, I'd say... Sylvia went on to say that Mary Ellen Morley had been killed by crushing blows to the chest and the head. But her demeanor seems... We took that information, went over to the San Mateo County Vital Statistics and researched documentation between 1910 and 1930, and in fact came up with a name that Sylvia Brown had, uh, had mentioned during dinner, uh, Mary Ellen Morley. Jennifer Towner and Jan Mucklestone continued to dig through the archives. They were intrigued by the newspaper accounts of Mary Ellen Morley's death. When she was killed, it made front page news. It was really chilling when I came upon that because all of a sudden she became very real. Mary Ellen Morley lived in Redwood City, California, near the San Francisco Bay. On the day of her death, Mary Ellen and her husband, Frederick, had driven north to visit her mother's grave. The cemetery was 15 miles from the Moss Beach Distillery. Returning home that same night, Frederick lost control of his car. It overturned and Mary Ellen was trapped inside. Oh, it's heavy. Get it off me, please. Oh. With her last breath, she begged Frederick to take care of their three-year-old no. son, Jack. Oh. Please take care of little Jack for me. Oh. Frederick frantically ran for help, but in the end, he could do nothing to save his wife. She died from crushing blows to the chest and the head. The exact injuries described by Sylvia Brown. The owner called Sylvia back to the Moss Beach Distillery for a sand. Because you've been walking so long. So long. Sylvia claimed that Mary Ellen Morley's spirit was weary from searching for her son, Jack. Sylvia also said Mary Ellen warned that there would soon be a fire at the restaurant. Four or five days later, we had a fire here in the restaurant. We had to close the restaurant temporarily. And that was really eerie. That was kind of scary. I've moved from uh, a one on a scale of 10 uh, of belief to uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of an eight, I would say, and a 10 with regard to my blue lady. I'm convinced she's here. Whether it's the lady in blue or Mary Ellen Morley, anyone at the Moss Beach Distillery is convinced that it's not only a place for humans to consume spirits, it's also haunted by them. Next, Jack Kerouac's landmark book, On the Road, inspires a woman to follow the same path. But that path leads to her unexplained disappearance. Mount Baker, Washington. Two joggers notice a piece of clothing dangling from a tree branch. Honey, there's a shirt or something up there. That's weird. See anyone around? Someone crashed down there. The SUV has plunged over a steep embankment. There were no signs of anyone or any indication that someone had been injured. The passport, money, and some clothing were found inside the car. Police traced the Jeep to a missing 23-year-old college student, Leah Roberts. Nine days earlier, Leah had left her home in Raleigh, North Carolina, without telling anyone where she was going. There are very few clues in this disturbing case. For instance, no one knows for sure if Leah Roberts was even in her car when it crashed. Only one thing is certain, that Leah Roberts left home on a journey of self-discovery, and she never returned. Leah is just a very awesome person. Everybody that meets her likes her. Very personable, great smile. 
but um, you know, she was kind of private also. When Leah was in her early 20s, her mother died unexpectedly. Then, Leah was involved in a near-fatal car accident. And finally, after a long illness, her father died. I think that all of those things together had the cumulative effect of making Leah even more introspective and probably more aware that although she didn't know what she wanted to do, I think she was unhappy that she wasn't achieving it. Leah found comfort in the writings of Jack Kerouac, the Beat Generation author who wrote about the free-spirited road trips he took across America. Leah's favorite was called The Dharma Bums. It's a story that encourages the reader to leave behind the materialism of modern life. Part of that book takes place at a forest fire lookout tower on Desolation Peak near Mount Baker in Washington State. From the last conversation that we had, we were talking about Dharma bombs. When Kerouac talks about... And about how Kerouac was Desolation. up on Desolation Peak, just taking in all the beauty around him. Are you inspired to go to Desolation Peak now? Yeah. I'd love to go to Desolation Peak. It appears that Leah Roberts secretly decided to turn her dreams into a reality. Just three months before she was to graduate from college, she packed up most of her cherished belongings and her cat, B, and took off for Desolation Peak, 3,000 miles across the country. It had been a period of like four days where we hadn't seen her, and we began to worry. Leah's family and friends filed a missing persons report and checked bank records for any activity on her account. She had made several cash withdrawals, tracing a route towards the West Coast. It took her only three days to get to Oregon. The day after we filed the missing persons report, um, I went over to Leah's house um, just to kind of check through things, see if I could find any clue, you know, just something to give me an answer. On Leah's dresser, Kara discovered a cryptic note. This is to cover bills while I'm gone. Have faith in me, yourself, everyone. Jack Kerouac. Leah's note said, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. Remember Jack Kerouac. That might be part of her trip. Five days later, Leah's SUV was discovered in Mount Baker National Forest near Desolation Peak. But Leah was nowhere to be found. Authorities estimated that the car was traveling about 40 miles an hour when it plunged over the embankment. Well, with the speed that the vehicle was traveling and the amount of damage to the vehicle, you would anticipate some type of injury uh, to the person inside. At least some type of evidence to indicate contact damage that the person had been inside the vehicle. Oh, man, look at this. There was no blood inside the SUV or in the surrounding area. Investigators wondered if Leah had even been in the car when it went over the edge. Um, there's nothing to indicate the wheel was tied and that was pushed off the road. We couldn't find any marks on the back to indicate anybody had pushed it. To make things even more confusing, blankets had been placed in the car's shattered windows. It appeared that someone used it as a shelter after the accident. We brought in dogs, we brought in search and rescue, and did a complete grid search up and down the road. And they weren't able to find any indication that anybody had left that vehicle. I mean, there's not even any blood anywhere in the steering column. The SUV was carefully examined at a police garage. It was full of Leah's personal belongings, a large amount of cash, an empty cat carrier. Found a diamond ring. And Leah's mother's diamond engagement ring. As long as I've known Leah, she has worn her mother's engagement ring. It was her most prized possession. And when we discovered that the ring had been found in the car, it was definitely um, a bad sign. There are several theories about the disappearance of Leah Roberts. She could have caught a ride, 
with the wrong person after the accident. She could be living somewhere with no memory of who she is or where she came from. Or perhaps Leah Roberts was inspired by her favorite author, Jack Kerouac, and left her former life behind in one final dramatic gesture. I can understand Leah's needing to get away and find some peace within herself, but considering the loss that our families experienced, it's difficult for me to think that, that she would leave us open for another loss like this. You don't ever know what someone's thinking in their head. No matter what they tell you, you still don't know. One week after Leah's car was found, a man called police to report that his wife had just seen Leah at a gas station 30 miles from Seattle. He didn't give his name, but said Leah appeared confused and disoriented. Before police could get more information, the caller hung up. Leah Roberts is five feet, six inches tall, and when last seen, weighed 130 pounds and had sandy blonde hair. She has a beauty mark on her right upper lip and a surgical scar on her right hip. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, a rapist attacks women throughout New York and a man wrongly convicted of two of those rapes is finally set free. Kansas City, Missouri. During a previous broadcast, we told you about George Marsh, a Kansas City laborer who died alone in a nursing home in 1982. George left behind $175,000, but had no known heirs or relatives. There were a few clues. One is this birth certificate showing that his original name was Josef Zalenka. There were also a few family photos, including this portrait of a young woman inscribed, your loving niece, Eleanor. We were hoping that someone who saw this story might have known George Marsh or his heirs. Update. Thanks to Unsolved Mysteries, George Marsh's relatives have been found. One of them was actually watching our broadcast. When I looked up and saw my senior high school picture on TV, I couldn't believe it. So then when he read your loving niece, Eleanor, that that's how it was signed. I was just stunned. I was just amazed. Eleanor Toller is George Marsh's long lost niece, the one who signed this high school photo for him. Her family lives in Rock Springs, Wyoming. Joseph's brother, Jim, has been looking for Joe since 1931. I have no idea why he kept away from the family, because there's no hard feelings. We were all united, always, in everything. The Zelinkas plan to divide $175,000 among Joe's surviving relatives. But more importantly, they want to bring his body back to the family burial site. I just feel good all over to know where he's at and I'd be able to bring his body back to rest with the rest of his family. For more than 20 years, police in Buffalo, New York, tried to catch a serial killer and rapist. And for more than 20 years, an innocent man remained behind bars for crimes that he did not commit. I was 17 years old, and I was walking to summer school. I was running a little bit late for school, so I decided to cut through the pass. And I was almost at the end of the path, and I heard something behind me. Hi, how you doing? And I didn't think anything of it, so I turned around and I kept walking. 
you know, I mean, he didn't look like someone I could, I had to fear. He looked like a normal, everyday guy. Shut up! Don't look at my face. He started dragging me back into the woods, and then he started strangling me. And then I thought, that's it, I was gonna die. It was, I really thought I'd never see any of my family again. And when he was finished, I asked him what's gonna happen, and he told me, he said nothing. He almost sounded sorry. And then he left. A few months later, the rapist was lying in wait as a 16-year-old girl walked to school along an isolated railroad track. Once again, he double-wrapped the rope around his victim's neck and taped her eyes shut. Almost a year later, another young girl was using this as a shortcut on her way to school. Uh, the same individual passed her and immediately afterwards double-wrapped a rope around her neck, gained control of her, and took her to the bush area behind me. He forced her to place tape over her eyes, he bound her, and sexually assaulted her. The four victims all described the rapist as a short, stocky man in his mid-30s who had a mustache. Four months passed, and then he claimed a fifth victim. Amherst, New York. A woman alone in a secluded place. Early morning. He placed a rope around her neck. He wrapped it twice. She described him as a very powerful man. He lifted her over this fence and took her into the wooded area over here where he bound her hands behind her back and he placed surgical tape over her eyes and at that point he raped her. The rapist would attack two more victims in Amherst. A 32-year-old female was using this path early in the morning for exercise. As she got to this point right here, a rope was placed around her neck and she was immediately rendered unconscious. She was then dragged into these woods up this way. The woman was found one hour later still unconscious. Double wrap marks on her neck told police who they were dealing with. But this time, it was different. This time, he nearly killed his victim. 22-year-old Linda Yalem, a student at the university in Buffalo, was next. <laughs> She was the seventh known victim, and she would be the first to die. Linda was left in the woods, her mouth and nose wrapped tight with duct tape. It was premeditated murder. He planned on killing her when he, when he grabbed her that day. Once he put that tape over her nose and her mouth, there was no chance for survival. After Linda's murder, the attacks stopped. Authorities wondered if the suspect had moved, gone to prison, or even died. And then four years later, a 14-year-old girl was raped in Buffalo. The serial rapist was back. This guy strikes so infrequently, he's very hard to, uh, to profile, very, very difficult. Uh, he's either got tremendous self-control, or else he's hitting in other parts of the country that we're not aware of. Update. More than 20 years after the so-called bike path rapist first struck, police arrested Altemio Sanchez, whose DNA matched samples found at the crime scenes. He was convicted of two murders and sentenced to 75 years to life. During their investigation, police learned that Sanchez had committed two other rapes in the same park where he claimed his first victim. They also discovered that an innocent man was serving a 35-year sentence for those two rapes. The wrongly convicted man, Anthony Capozzi, was finally set free after serving 21 years behind bars. In a moment, an infant who is pronounced dead at birth makes a miraculous recovery. Jefferson, Indiana. 
When Todd and Tammy Carroll arrived at the hospital for the birth of their third child, a son named Logan. Hi, Dr. O'Connor. They had far greater fears than the typical expected parents. Their second child, Megan, had been stillborn. Well, Tammy, everything looks great. I was worried, is anything going to be wrong with this baby? Is everything going to be all right? And after the ultrasound, and everything looked good on it, and then we ran some other tests that looked fine. Um, that eased my mind. I, I really tried to uh, look at it as a separate incident. OK, here comes the next one. Here we go, Tammy. Tammy's Take sister, head. Ruthie, push, push. stood near the fetal heartbeat monitor. The red numbers showed a normal rate, 120, 140 beats per minute, at least at first. Logan Carroll was born 12 minutes later. Then his heart stopped. I didn't feel any pulse at all. And that's when we started CPR. Why is he crying? Call a code. The emergency team tried desperately to revive Logan. I'll take over now, Brent. Thank you. What's the history here? An eventful pregnancy. We lost the heart rate immediately before delivery. You lost the heart rate? No After heart rate. 15 minutes, Logan still had no vital signs, no, heart rate no heartbeat, no breathing. Stop compression. No heart rate flatline. Continue resuscitation. We had continued doing CPR throughout that time. And I began inserting a line into his umbilical cord to try to administer some drugs to help revive him. They had put uh, EKG monitor on him, and the tracing was not showing any electrical activity. So I, I knew it didn't look good at all. <laughs> Todd, why? Well, I was still hoping, but he was there so long. I don't know how many five or six doctors there working on him. I, I, I just couldn't lose this baby. I just could not believe this could happen again. Logan James Carroll was officially pronounced dead at 5.15 PM. I'm sorry. He was 33 no. minutes old. No. Oh, no. At some point, you know, you always have to just say, we've done what we can do. This baby is not going to respond. and. We finally called it and pronounced him dead at that time. I don't think there's any lower feeling than holding your dead child. Sitting there holding him and looking in his face, I just wanted him to be alive so bad. Tammy and Todd agreed to an autopsy. They wanted to know why. I don't mean to sound crass or anything, but uh, we usually take pictures of the baby for the family. You, you never know how people are going to take that when you come in and say, I'd like to take pictures of you and the baby. But they were very receptive because they said they didn't get enough pictures the last time that this had happened to them. These photos were taken that horrible afternoon. Sad portraits meant to commemorate the end of a young life. Instead, they were the beginning of a miracle. What was that? What was what? You just made a noise. That was just a reflex action, Tammy. <laughs> Are you sure? I'm sorry. While I was holding Logan, he made the gasping sound. And it was a very eerie feeling, but we had been told that that was normal. It is called agonal gasping, and it can happen because of the medication. It can go on for quite a while. So I wanted to let them know, because every time he would do that, he did it a couple times for Tammy, they would just, their eyes would light up and then they would be really let down when he wouldn't do it again. 40 minutes had passed since Logan was pronounced dead. The time for his autopsy was approaching. His color looks so good. Ruthie, he's getting warmer.
I'll be right back. What's going on, Ruthie? There's no reason for this to have happened. Dr. O'Conn, I understand about agonal breathing, but is there such a thing as an agonal heart rate? Susan. He has a heart rate. Please come and take a look at him. I think I was afraid that she was reacting in a way that was going to upset the family even more because, I mean, the baby was dead. This baby's alive. What's going on? What? It was total unbelief. I don't know how soon it was, but it was real soon. They came and took my IV out, and I had monitors on me, and I had a blood pressure cuff. I mean, they were taking wires and just pulling them off of me and wheeled me into the nursery. And I reached in, and I held his arm. And uh, I, I was talking to him, telling him that he had to hang in there, and that I loved him, and that I was proud of him for being so strong. Earlier, six physicians and eight registered nurses we're all certain that Logan Carroll had died. High-tech meters and monitors confirmed that judgment. I figured God's hand had to have been in it, but that's not in the medical literature <laughs> to account for the miraculous as an explanation. Call Dr. Valentine and get the baby buggy set. It's amazing. I mean, we're all trained to do something as doctors, and here we did nothing, and he came back. Word spread through the hospital very quickly. It was it was incredible. The emergency room doctor came up and was totally amazed. It was it was something. It was something. Logan's transformation from the lifeless infant in this photo to the squirming baby boy videotaped just one day later was amazing. Logan remained in the hospital for the next five weeks, and his vital signs never faltered again.